Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari. This is the great big history podcast. And in today's episode, we do the collapse of the Ottoman Turks and the Ottoman Empire. The first thing that happens is the money dries up. Trade moved to the oceans. And a lot of it has to do with the destruction of the Silk Road by the Mongols. Not in the initial conquest, not in the Genghis Khan conquest, though there was a lot of destruction of northern China, Central Asia, and the Middle East in that, but especially in the wars between the grandkids. By the time you get to the grandkids and then the great-grandkids, these successor Mongols of the four or five major empires are perfectly happy going to war against each other and smashing things along the way. Tamerlane in Iran is the most spectacular of them, obliterating entire cities, murdering lots of people. So the Silk Road essentially shut down. The second thing that happened is the New World was discovered. In 1492, Columbus sails the ocean blue, comes back to say, hey, there's land out there. And more people will go back and discover there's a lot more land out there. And so ocean trade will replace land trade for the first time. The second is we have a series of bad rulers. Now, there's a reason why in the video there's Jafar up there. We'll get to him in a moment. But see, less money isn't necessarily a problem. If you have good rulers, they just need to be more efficient. This is still a large empire. It still runs uh, Southeastern Europe, Asia Minor, the Middle East, Egypt. These are major places. So we're fine. There's, there will be money. There's not as much money, but there will be money. All we need is good rulers. What happened? A series, a long series of bad and weak rulers. Less money did not lead to more efficiency. What it actually led to is more decadence. As increasingly rulers said, eh, I don't have the money to build giant armies and conquer Europe. So you know what I'm going to do? Go in my hot tub. I'm going to take a uh, hundred girls into my harem, 200 girls, 300 girls into my harem. I'm going to close up the palace and good luck with that. And we get a series of bad rulers who use that less money for themselves. So you get more decadence. So what we get is a series of grand viziers. We get Jafar. We get a series of grand viziers. V-I-Z-I-E-R-S. We get a series of grand viziers. Some are good, and many, like Jafar from Aladdin, are selfish. Why? Why would they be selfish? Well, because they're not the ruler. They're just some dude making decisions for the ruler. What does that mean? The Ottoman Empire technically belongs to the sultan, to the ruler. So he has every reason to want it to succeed. The Grand Vizier is not the ruler and not necessarily going to be the ruler. Is not of the ruling family. He's a worker. He's an employee. This means if things go well, he doesn't get a whole lot of credit. The Sultan does. But if things go badly, he's going to get blamed. So you would say, oh, well, well in that... They have every interest to do well. Well, yes, but they also have an interest not to mess anything up, to not change, to not innovate, to not make any decision. That's a risk because if it goes bad, 
you're in trouble. And so what a lot of them do is pad their families. They hire their family members to big jobs because they could trust them. And they make sure that a good amount of tax money goes into everybody's pockets. They're selfish. Because they don't know how much time they've got to be in charge. So the one thing they know they can make it good for is themselves. Now, what's good for the Grand Vizier may be good for the Ottoman Empire, but it also may not be. And so what you increasingly get is a level of corruption, accepted corruption, by the way, because the rulers could end this and they don't because they want to be left alone. And as long as they get enough money in their palace to have a good time, a lot of them are perfectly fine. letting the empire coast. So the trade moves the oceans, which means there's less money. A larger percentage of that less money is now taken up with sultan decadence, but a now a large percentage, I don't know how much, but a, 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 an increasingly sizable percentage, as time goes on, it becomes bigger, is sh sifted away into people's pockets in corruption. And those are going to be the vizier and the families and the allies of the vizier. So you can see already the wheels are starting to slow down. Third, the Janissaries. The Janissaries start to become conservative. Why? Well, they're the best troops which means they start to get privileges along the way because they could be trusted. So when the sultans along the way need things, or more importantly, don't, don't have the money to pay for things, they'll go to the Janissaries and say, look, I need you to do this thing, but I can't pay you. How about I give you two months off a year? And the Janissaries say, sure, we're loyal. We understand. You don't always have cash. We'll do it. We'll put down that rebellion. We get eight weeks off. Hey, I don't have the money to pay you. We have less and less money. Um, but I'm totally cool with you using your weekends to like um, start your own businesses. You could do it right here in Constantinople. I'll set you up. We'll, we'll, you'll, you won't pay any taxes. All right. Well, we're cool with that. Thank you, Mr. Sultan. We, we, when you get money, we'd like you to be paid. We like to be paid, but we understand. And so, increasingly, they get privileges separate from being in the army, separate from being soldiers, and they don't want those privileges messed with. And so, they become conservative because they don't want to change. So increasingly, they take on anti-modernity policies, which is ironic. And it's ironic because when the Janissaries start, they are the most tip of the sword. They are the most technologically advanced of all armies out there by, all, by far, really. Their, their siege train of cannons was no one else had one. It's going to take the Swedes in the 1600s to kind of build another one. Um, a real kind of firepower army. That's a hundred years later to what the Turks had. And so the Janissaries increasingly become anti-modern because you can't be conservative and be modern because modernity is about change. Conservatism is about maintaining what you have. And so these anti-modernity policies equals, eventually comes to coups, C-O-U-P-S, to get rid of a ruler. See, if you get a ruler who goes, no, I need you to do this. I need you to innovate. I need you to do these things. 
The Janissaries say, no. And the ruler says, I'm going to make you. Or, all right, fine. But I'm going to make a Turkish, because you guys are all Christians, I'm going to make a Turkish infantry, and I'm going to give them super modern guns. And they're going to be awesome. And they're going to work seven days a week instead of your five days a week. And they're going to work 12 months a year instead of your 10 months a year. And the Janissaries say, oh, really? Yeah, I'm going to do that. Well, where are they now? Well, I don't have them now. And the Janissaries say, oh, really? You don't have them now? We have lots of guns. So, bye. They shoot the Janissary. They shoot the Sultan. Turn to his brother and say, so, how do you feel about making a completely new Turkish military army? And the brother says, oh, I don't like that idea at all. And the Janissaries say, thank you, Mr. Sultan. Put them on the throne. Go back about their business. And so, again, we have another influence on weak rulers. The Janissaries can't take over on their own. They are Christians. They are servants of the Sultan. But they can influence who gets on the throne because they have the best weapons and they're in Constantinople. And so what happens is they make sure that whoever the ruler is won't mess up their good time. Now that's a problem because they don't live in a vacuum. Because what's happening is Germany or the Germans, they're not united yet, the French, the Swedes, later on the Russians are all innovating. They all looked at those cannons of the Turks and said, oh, I, gotta get, I gotta get some of those. And so with the money coming out of the new world, and there's so much money coming out of the new world, Spain, France, uh, England, are all innovating in ways that are going to make them more powerful. So the Turks are losing their lead and they may or may not know it. And the Janissaries are less and less inclined to go fight them. Like, they don't want to go to Africa, to Somalia to put down a rebellion. They don't want to go out to Iran to fight the, to fight the Persians. No, send somebody else. We're here. We're in Constantinople. And so increasingly you have a military that you can't use. And they're there to protect their own privilege. And so here's, here's our map. Of, it's a map of the Silk Road or the Silk Roads that go from China and India up the rivers across Central Asia into the Middle East, into Iran, northern Iran, into um, what is modern-day Iraq and Turkey to Constantinople. That's what it looked like in the ancient world, in the medieval world. Now here's a map of Dutch trade in 1600, 1650. And you'll notice none of the lines of trade. They go to New York. They go to South America. They go to different little cities in Africa. They are all on the ocean. None are in Central Asia. None are in the Middle East. And that's all money. All money. So just the map tells you that the economy was changing and the Turks who had been in the best place you can be in 1200 are now completely left out of what is happening. What are the results? The results are the Turks will dominate poor regions of Slavic Europe and the Arab world. They're still tough. They're still big. The Janissaries can still win battles. Increasingly not against Europeans, but against other peoples in the Middle East, Southeastern Europe, they can do that. They are increasingly falling behind Western Europe. There are um, three attacks 
on Vienna. The last is in the 1690s, and it's a loss. And not only is it a loss, it actually, the counterattack, it collapsed. In the first two attacks, uh, Vienna is important because it's the it's the basically the capital of Germany. It's the capital of the Austrian uh, kingdom. It's the capital of the Habsburgs. It's basically the capital of Germany at this point. And the first two times of attacking it, they lost. The first one was close. The second one was a bigger loss, but they were able to withdraw. It didn't change much. The attack in the 1690s was a big loss, and not only was it a big loss, the army fell apart, and the Austrian-German counterattack took over Hungary, took over Belgrade, which is in Serbia, which the Turks had owned like 300 years. Uh, it threatened the entire what's going to happen in, in, in Eastern Europe. It opened the entire bag of worms. A bag of worms, a problem of what will happen in Europe, in southeastern Europe, in the Balkans, that is going to cause uh, the Crimean War. It is going to nearly cause a second major war, and then it's going to cause or be one of the causes in the First World War. So for the next 200 years, this is a problem. This is going to be a problem. So Southeastern Europe now has a, a frontier that's moving. Every war, Austria and the Europeans are taking more land away from the Turks. In 1797, Napoleon, out of nowhere, shows up in Egypt. He arrives. Now his idea was to, to I guess, be a new Alexander and march all the way to India. I, I, don't, I don't really know. I got to be honest. It's, it's one of those, it's before Napoleon's Napoleon. It's, Napoleon is in the act of becoming Napoleon. And it's kind of crazy that he goes there. There's no Suez Canal, so, but it's about war with the British. Um, and it's really about, about threatening um, British control of India. But it's a long way away. It's a long walk. So, it, I mean, it took Alexander 10 years. So, but Napoleon evades Egypt. He also brings with him a thousand scientists with him. This is like the Europeans going back to the ancient world. They'll discover the Rosetta Stone. They'll uh, make paintings in the shadow of the, of the pyramids. They'll actually fight a battle called the Battle of the Pyramids. Napoleon evades Egypt and crushes the Turks. The new army of the Europeans and the very new revolutionary army, which is completely different than the, than the kingly armies of the last hundred years. This Leve, L-E-V-E-E, -E -E, in, E-N, Mass, M-A-S-S-E, the Leve and Mass, a kind of giant conscripted army that Europe probably hadn't seen since the Romans. Um, just absolutely crushes the Turkish forces. Takes Egypt, sets up their own guy, their own independent ruler, and shows to the, to the Arabs and the shows to basically everybody that the European, the Turks are no longer in the big leagues. They're now in... Division One. They're in, in the minor leagues. They they can't compete. In 1821, a rebellion by the Greeks with European help gives Greece independence. The Europeans like this because it was Greece. Oh, Socrates and and um, Plato and Aristotle and uh, many really liberal kind of romantics. Uh, Lord Byron will go there to help win independence. And when they they go there, they kind of realize these aren't the ancient Greeks. This isn't Alexander and Thucydides. This is um, a bunch of goat herders who haven't really done anything since they were Byzantines. 
and are kind of disappointed. It's not what they expected. The Greeks like, uh, we're Greek. And they're like, yeah, but you're not the right kind of Greeks. Like, we've been studying Latin and we I wanted Odysseus. I got you. And so Europeans kind of, it's the first instance of the Europeans going to, to Southeastern Europe and realizing it's different than what they expected it to be. But in 1821, Greece, Greece gets its independence. In the 1870s, the Balkans, the Balkan states, Serbia, Croatia, Bulgaria, Romania, will all gain their independence. Uh, after a series of Russian wars, the Russians will win, and the Russians are, will say, we're Slavs, you're Slavs, we're all Slavs together. How about we own you? And the Slavs of Southeastern Europe said, yeah, look, Russia, um, I need a little time. We just got out of a relationship with the Turks that was like for 500 years, and it and it didn't end happy. So we just need a little bit of time before, just for ourselves, before we get into a thing. And the Russians are like, uh, okay, that's cool. We're cool. I understand. Um, but how about we just hang out? Like, we'll be besties. We'll, we'll, we'll like... You know, you need things and I can give you things like and 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 no pressure, no pressure. But, you know, if if you want. You know, we could hook up, but 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 it, it, it's up to you. I'm just saying. I'm into you. And I got lots of stuff to offer. And so that's important. Why is that going to be important? We're going to talk about that with World War I. That relationship of independent, but it has a Russia on the side, is going to matter when World War I begins. It's in fact the spark that will cause World War I. And so what's happening is what was Turkish Southeastern Europe is now fractured into Romania, Bulgaria, Serbia, Croatia, um, maybe Slovenia. I, I think Slovenia is absorbed by the Austrians. Uh, there's Hungary. Uh, there's Greece. And what are all these people going to do? Fight each other. And the Turks. Like when they're not fighting each other, they fight the Turks. And so it's a giant mess. How much of a mess? A famous quote from Otto von Bismarck. Bismarck is going to be the man who unifies Germany. The Chancellor, the Iron Chancellor, he's going to defeat the French. He's going to make Germany not only unified in 1871, but into a global power, into a Germany we are still dealing with. There is a quote of, from him about when will the next war happen? When will the, great, the next great war happen? And he says, oh, it's going to be caused by some damn fool thing in the Balkans. And he was right. It was a damn fool thing in the Balkans. 20 million people are going to be killed by it. And it starts in the Balkans. With all these little groups fighting each other. All right. So what is Western Europe doing? Western Europe at this time is poor, divided, at war, constantly it's illiterate it's uneducated it's rural it's superstitious it's diseased it's dirty it's corrupt it's violent and yet as we've already started to talk about in 1500 that's all true what's going to happen is the europeans are going to conquer the world so much so that today the leading country in the world is a European cultural country, the United States. And the leading religions are Western religions. The leading philosophies are Western philosophies. The leading language is a Western language, English. The world is still, 500 years later, in a European cultural bath. It's not that everybody's European. 
but a lot, I have traveled a lot of places and English has done me pretty well. And if not English, French will help in a lot more places. So could I learn more languages? Sure. But guess what? Don't really need them. And that's what happens. That the Europeans are going to militarily conquer much of the world, but then culturally change world culture into European culture. Okay. Thank you. When we come back, we start doing Europe.